Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our Five Minute Histories videos. And today I'm on the shores of the Chesapeake Bay, south of Annapolis at a place called Cars Beach. For generations, black Baltimoreans, black Marylanders, black Americans flocked here in the summertime. Today it is a public park, thanks in large part to the efforts of an organization called Blacks of the Chesapeake. And I am thrilled that I'm gonna be joined by Vince Leggett, their president uh, in just a moment. Moment. But before I turn it over to Mr. Leggett, let me say a few words about Cars Beach and a quick thanks to PNC. This is the second of our summer series of videos uh, featuring places where Baltimoreans went in the summertime, um, and PNC is the sponsor, so thank you so much. All right, Cars Beach, let's start not in 1926 when it officially opened, but back to 1902. That's when a gentleman named Frederick Carr and his wife, Mary Wells Carr, purchased 180 acres of waterfront property property here south of Annapolis. Frederick was born enslaved and worked at the Naval Academy, earned up enough money to buy this enormous uh, waterfront property. Um, at first, the cars uh, played host to boarders and uh, hosted some events, um, and that turned out to be pretty good. By 1926, they officially opened uh, as a beach resort catering to black patrons. There were a number of other uh, black beaches here uh, right next door, Elktonia uh, Beach, Sparrows Beach, uh, just along the coastline here. This was at a time when many beaches like Ocean City were closed uh, to black patrons. Um, the first uh, sort of manager of the property was the Carr's daughter, Elizabeth Carr Smith. Under her watch, uh, this place became a magnet for folks from Baltimore and Washington, Philadelphia, Richmond, even further away. Um, it uh, could draw really enormous crowds. For a small fee, you could spend the day here swimming in the waters, uh, 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 riding amusement uh, rides, uh, eating your way through lots of different uh, food vendors. In 1948, however, sadly, Elizabeth died in a car crash. Her son, uh, Fred Jr., uh, took over. The, the beach stayed in the family, and he turned to a financier uh, that many black Baltimoreans turned to in the day to, uh, to help bring in capital to improve this place, and that person was Little Willie Adams, the number runner turned uh, businessman. With help from from uh, Little Willie, uh, Fred Jr. added a midway here and a music venue uh, called Club Benghazi. Um, and uh, this place was part of what we now call the Chitlin Circuit. That was a series of venues that black musicians, black comedians, black entertainers uh, would travel to around the country. The Cotton Club in New York, the Madam Walker Theater in Indianapolis, the Keyhole Club in San Antonio, the Royal Theater in Baltimore. And as musicians were heading from northern venues uh, down south to places in Georgia and Florida, almost all of them would stop here. Little Richard, James Brown, Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, the Coasters, the Drifters, Ray Charles, pretty much everybody, and the crowds would get enormous. For one concert in 1956, uh, Chuck Berry drew 70,000 people here. I think the venue at the time only held 8,000, so I'm not 100% sure what happened. James Brown in 1962 drew 11,000. Baltimoreans like Billy Holiday and Cab Calloway uh, drew, sold, drew sold out crowds uh, as well. The audience for these shows was wider than even the tens of thousands of people uh, here uh, physically, in large part uh, due to a disc jockey uh, named Hoppy Adams. Charles Wilson Adams Jr. for almost 50 years was on the AM airways out of WANN Annapolis, um, broadcasting in uh, all over the place. Lots of bro live broadcasts here at concerts at Cars Beach. Um, his influence was so great that his traveling box, that's a wooden box he used to put his stuff in when he would broadcast live from afar, his traveling box is in the Smithsonian, and a foundation in his name is still going strong, uh, largely helping uh, area youth. All right, I'm going to wrap up with the final chapter. In the 1960s, uh, the club got new owners, the beach got new owners, and they tried to make a go of it with uh, turning to rock 
rock concerts. Uh, groups like Led Zeppelin played here. But after the formal segregation of beaches ended in the 1960s, uh, black beaches uh, started to decline. And the last concert here was in 1973, uh, a hometown hero, uh, none other than Frank Zappa. But when the last concert ended and the resort eventually closed, things fell into disrepair. But that is not the final chapter. Uh, it is now a public, uh, public park owned by the city of Annapolis, in large part thanks to groups like Blacks of the Chesapeake and Vince Leggett. And with that, I am going to turn it over to Mr. Leggett. We are all yours. Hi, I'm Vince Leggett, founding president of the Blacks of the Chesapeake, and we started the project in 1984, and in 1999, we converted it to a 501c3 foundation. You might be surprised, but uh, on June 26th, I turned 70 years old. I might look good, but this is all that's left of me, 70 years later, but to be doing this work, documenting the history and the heritage of African Americans on the Chesapeake Bay. Because my tagline is, this bay is your bay, this bay is our bay. And let's celebrate the history and the legacy of the Chesapeake Bay and tell a more complete story. Another thing I'm proud of, I carry the moniker Admiral of the Chesapeake Bay. And this is the highest honor that a Maryland governor can bestow on a private citizen in the environmental conservation field. And it's a, man, a mantle that I carry with pride and distinction, particularly since we're trying to tell a hard story. And the hard story is the contributions that African Americans have made to the maritime and seafood processing industry. If you go to any college, or public university or library and pick up books on the Chesapeake Bay, it's very seldom you see people of color. If you do, the captain says crab picker and oyster shucker, no other attributes. Well, we've taken those photographs and have gone to 200 length of the Chesapeake Bay from Cape Charles and Cape Henry and the Virginia Capes to the Upper Bay and telling little known stories about light, black life on the bay. Today, I wanna to talk about leisure, recreation, and entertainment on the Chesapeake Bay during the period of segregation. And we're standing on what I describe as the black coast of the Chesapeake Bay. Luminaries like Frederick Douglass and his son established Highland Beach and other waterfront communities, African American waterfront communities, Oyster Harbor, a run on the bay and further down the bay, Columbia Beach in the Shady Side area. These were all places where African Americans had to establish their own because they couldn't go to other people's. And it's a story of resiliency. It's a story that must be told. You could tell the history of American music from this exact longitude and latitude, going back to gospels and people like in the Baltimore area, uh, Pauline Wells Lewis and just great names like that in gospel and the concerts that she put together. Those groups would come down to the beaches. Uh, they had jazz and blues guys, Muddy Waters. I mean, we talked about Count Basie's orchestra or Chick Webb's band. I mean, more Baltimore people, even up to the uh, Motown sounds. I mean, we've seen these glow posters. These are those colorful posters that look like old boxing posters and Globe Poster Company in Baltimore would uh, design these to let you know who was coming up next. And people like Hoppy Adams, can you imagine 50,000 watts of power? When you had 10,000 people coming down these one roads and rabbit trails and as they say, Chuck Berry with 70,000 people. I mean, even the governor's phone was ringing off saying they're stopping interstate commerce. You couldn't get down to old 301 and even just imagine before the 1950s when the Bay Bridge came in, things were popping down at, on these beaches. But what we're trying to do now is to preserve that history, preserve that heritage. And the good news is, out of those 180 acres, there were five acres that were left. The other 75 acres have been converted into a wastewater treatment plant, a classic environmental justice issue. Another is the villages of Chesapeake Harbor, a 400 marina restaurant gated community. 17 years ago, I was part of an effort to try to rescue this last five acres. I had the vision, but my money was short. 
And so we teamed up with the city of Annapolis, the Chesapeake Conservancy, the Conservation Fund, the state of Maryland to amass $6.4 million to rescue this five acres of land, to be able to tell the story of black life on the Chesapeake Bay from an authentic space. We have the dirt and the sand. And so let's connect that poster on the wall or that photograph in your old album book where you can come by and hear the seagulls walking. You can hear the waves lapping. You can put your feet in the sand and just imagine, imagine just the sights and sounds. And if these trees could talk, oh, what would the stories be?